Neural networks are really useful tools in engineering because of how versatile they are. They can model complex nonlinear systems, they can predict time series trends, they can find patterns in high dimensional data, and they can classify images, all with impressive accuracy. But when it comes to safety critical systems, there's a big question. And that is, can you actually guarantee the output of your network? So take an image classifier for an autonomous vehicle as an example. Let's say that you test your network with this input image and it can correctly identify the vehicle, which then allows the rest of the system to safely respond to it. That's pretty good, right? But will your network recognize the vehicle in this different image? Or what about this one? You probably want to test those inputs as well. And testing in this manner is important, but it is a stochastic approach where you gain confidence in the network by sampling inputs across the entire input space. But how small do the deviations have to be in your input before you still have confidence in the output without actually having to test it? For example, if I zoom in on the pixels of this vehicle, and if I just add the smallest amount of noise to this image, it was so small in fact that you probably can't even see the change, can you be confident that the neural network won't suddenly misclassify it, even though it's essentially the same image? With testing, the only way to know is to test all of the variations. And since there are effectively infinite variations, that's impossible. Even after hundreds of thousands of tests, you still have no guarantees for untested inputs. And that's where formal verification comes in. Instead of testing inputs one by one, we can mathematically prove that every input within a specified region maps to outputs that all lie within a corresponding region. If that output region sits entirely inside the bounds of the behavior that we want, then we've guaranteed the network will behave correctly for all of those inputs. So in our driving example here, this means that we can prove the network will still classify the image as a vehicle even when the pixel values vary within the allowed range. So let's talk about how all of this is possible. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. In this video, I want to explain formal verification conceptually so that you have a more intuitive understanding of how it works rather than dive too deeply into the mathematics. I think that once you understand the concept, then you can just you know, use the MATLAB Deep Learning Toolbox and Verification Library to handle the mathematical heavy lifting, but you'll at least have a good idea of what is happening behind all of those functions. All right, so to keep this explanation simple, let's look at a toy neural network one proposed by the Deep Poly team at ETH Zurich. This network has two inputs, x1 and x2, and we can think of them as two pixels or two data points. So those two inputs pass through a fully connected layer with weights of one, 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 and minus one, and biases of zero and zero. So that's how we sort of read this diagram. And then they go through a ReLU activation where positive values are passed through and negative values are clipped at zero. Then there's another fully connected layer, another ReLU, and then finally one more fully connected layer to get the outputs. So as a quick example, if we set both inputs to zero, we can then trace the math through the layers and then see that the output of the network is x11 is one and x12 is zero. Now we can claim that since x11 is greater than x12, this network would assign whichever label is associated with x11. For example, you know, maybe x11 being large represents a car in this two pixel image. So a zero zero input corresponds to a car. Now the question becomes, will the network still return the car label if we allow both x1 and x2 to vary between minus one and one? That is, for every possible input within this white square, will the network still return values that exist on the right side of this red line? Now, we talked about a common approach to this is testing, where we just would pick a bunch of random points inside the input region, run them through the network, and then check the outputs. And in this simple 2D case, it looks like, yeah, they do all land on the right side of the decision boundary. So, you know, maybe we feel pretty confident. But there's at least two problems with this testing approach. And one is that, well, first off, this network is really tiny, and so a few hundred random points does a pretty good job of covering the input space. But real networks are huge and high dimensional, and it's not easy to tell if the output is contained within a well-defined region like this. And two, 
Even with billions of tests, you'll never cover everything. Like we said, there's always untested inputs. So to overcome these two problems, we use formal methods. With this approach, instead of individual points to fill out the input space, we define a region using constraints and then run those constraints through the network. And there are several ways to do this. The first approach we can try is something called the polyhedra method. Here, we describe the feasible inputs as a set of inequalities. So for this example, one inequality is that x1 must be less than or equal to 1. Then we also have x1 must be greater than or equal to minus 1. And then we have the same for x2. And so we can now represent these constraints in the form ax must be less than or equal to b, where x is the input vector space. And in our case, it's x1 and x2. So now at this point, we can push these constraints through the first layer of our network. Basically for this simple layer, we are applying the affine map y equals wx plus d, where y is the output vector space, x3 and x4, and w and d are the weight and bias matrices for the fully connected layer. Now, a little bit of math shows that the new constraints in the x3 and x4 space are given by these matrix inequalities which if we plot on the graph, we can see that they perfectly bound the feasible space after the first fully connected layer. Now for the ReLU layer, since you know the ReLU is just passing through positive values, we can capture that by adding new constraints, one for each neuron. So we would have x3 must also be greater than or equal to zero, and x4 must be greater than or equal to zero. And I can show these new constraints on this graph. Now, keep in mind that this is, again, a toy example that consists of just fully connected layers where W is actually invertible, and with an activation function that can be bounded perfectly with a linear inequality constraint. But polyhedra methods are also possible with more complex networks as well. But again, the math here isn't as important as the concept of what we mean when we say that we're pushing these constraints through the network. So if we keep doing that, we push this new set of boundaries through the next layer of the network, and then you know we add more constraints for the ReLU, and then finally push these through to the output. So what we're left with is a set of eight constraints, the four that we started with and the four that we picked up along the way. And by the end, we have a polyhedron that bounds every possible output for the given input space. Now we just check. Does this polyhedron lie entirely on one side of the decision boundary? If yes, then we've proven that the property holds. Now, this is pretty easy to tell for this two-dimensional output, but in reality, often the output will be in higher dimensions and there could be hundreds or thousands of constraints. Remember, we're adding one for every neuron in each activation layer. So, you know, checking if the constraint holds is a linear programming problem, and solving this can be prohibitively difficult for really big networks. So that's kind of a downside of this method. It's very computationally intensive. Luckily, there's another approach that we can use that doesn't require linear programming, and that is by defining the feasible input space using intervals. With intervals, we're not tightly bounding the space like we did with polyhedra, but instead we're just keeping track of the maximum and minimum possible values. So the intervals for the range of possible inputs for our example is that both x1 and x2 lie between minus one and one. This produces this yellow square as the potential set of inputs. Now, so far this looks exactly like the polyhedra approach, right? But you're gonna see shortly how it's different. But the first thing we need to do though is talk about interval math. We can keep track of how the intervals change as we perform math operations. So let's say that we add our two variables, x1 and x2, together. What is the interval of the resulting x3? Well, since x1 could be as small as minus one, and x2 could also be as small as minus one, then the summation of them could be as small as minus two. And similarly, the two inputs could each be one, and so the sum could be two. Therefore, the interval of the output variable x3 is between minus two and two. We've essentially added the intervals together. And we could do the same trick with multiplication and division and any other operation that exists within our network. All right, so this means that after the first fully connected layer, 
we can see that x3 could be between minus 2 and 2. You know, like we said, we're just adding the two inputs together. And x4 has the same interval since we're just subtracting the two inputs. Therefore, the bounding box using intervals looks like this. And the thing to note here is that with intervals, we're overestimating the true feasible set since we're just looking at the max and mins for each variable. But we're using mathematics that are much easier to calculate. Now, for the ReLU layer, this is really easy also because if the lower bound is negative, then we can just set it to zero. And then from here, we can push these intervals through the rest of the network. Now, at the end here, another benefit of intervals is that we don't need linear programming to determine if the final constraint is violated. We can just check the points at the extreme corners of the bounds. Now, unfortunately with this example, the interval method is so conservative that it just so happens to exceed the constraint. So, you know, even though we know the network is good, we'd actually conclude here that the network does not meet the constraint. But in general, hopefully you can see that this is how we can use intervals to verify a network. Now, what we're gaining here in speed and simplicity, we're obviously losing in accuracy. In fact, here you can see the interval method is actually even more conservative than the true maximum and minimum values of the output. The interval here is claiming that the output of x11 could be as high as about seven, whereas we can see from the data that it's probably closer to five. So what's going on here? Well, to answer that question, let's look at an even simpler network and see how intervals play out. Let's say that the interval for x1 is between minus one and one, and x2 is then equal to x1 because of this weight of one and bias of zero here. And therefore the interval for x2 is the same, minus one to one. And x3 is equal to minus x1, which also happens to produce the same interval. So now we move on to the next layer x4 is equal to x3 plus 0.5 x2. So this means that x4 could be as low as negative 1.5 if both x2 and x3 are at their extreme negative values. And x4 can be as high as positive 1.5. So this is what we would claim with the interval method. However, in this way, we're treating x2 and x3 completely independent of each other. We're saying that they can each be any of the values between these intervals. However, we know that they're both functions of x1, and therefore their values are actually correlated in some way. In fact, they're correlated such that x2 and x3 can never be at their extreme values at the exact same time. And we can figure that out by going backwards through the network and check for those correlations. So here we know that x4 is 0.5x2 plus x3, and then x2 and x3 are x1 and minus x1 respectively, which means that x4 is really equal to negative 0.5 x1. Therefore, the true interval for the output is really between minus 0.5 and 0.5, which is three times narrower than we got from just a naive interval approach alone. So instead of just passing intervals forward, modern verification algorithms like deep poly and crown also propagate information backward from the output constraint. And this backward pass lets them tighten the bounds at each layer, like I'm showing here with the orange boxes, squeezing the intervals closer to the true feasible region. And this is what is implemented within the MATLAB function estimate network output bounds from the Deep Learning Toolbox Verification Library. And I've linked to an example below showing you how this function works on a more complex neural network. In fact, you can see from the documentation all of the different layer types that this function supports. So it's a pretty powerful way to verify your deep neural networks. All right, let me just show you one more thing. In some cases, this tighter boundary can be enough to verify your network. However, it's still inherently more conservative than the polyhedra method. And so we might still get some false violations, you know, like we're seeing here. But we have one more trick up our sleeves. Perfectly tight intervals bound the data along each axis. In this case, our data is skewed relative to the output axes, and therefore, the bounding box has quite a lot of excess area. However, let's say that we rotate the data such that we minimize the bounding area, or at the very least, we minimize it in the direction of the constraint. In this way, we would have the best chance of verifying the system using this method, right? So, for example, if we look at the data from this perspective along this axis, a tight bounding box would look like this. 
which is fully contained on the right side of this line. But we really only care about the axis perpendicular to the constraint, since that's the axis that determines whether the data falls to the left or the right label. And if we squeeze this data down to that one axis, we can see that the data spans between about one on the low side and about three on the high side. And since both values are on the right side of the line, this constraint is verified. Now that's the visual interpretation, but we want to do this algorithmically. And in MATLAB, we can do this pretty simply with the verify network robustness function. This function takes in the network to be verified, and it also takes in the lower and upper bounds on the inputs. And then this fourth input here specifies which label you are checking for. And in our case, since we're looking to see if the first output is greater than the second output, we're checking to see if the output always has the first label. Now, behind the scenes, this is running the deep poly algorithm to get those really tight interval bounds. And then it's effectively doing that final rotation of the outputs to confirm that the output is completely contained within the area of the first label. And when I run this script, you can see that it is in fact verified, like we expected. And I left a link to this script if you want to try it out yourself. And I've also left links to the Deep Poly and the Crown research papers below if you want to read more about these methods. So that's the big picture here. Random testing of your network can give you confidence for sure, but there's no guarantees. Formal methods can give you those guarantees. And you know we have polyhedra methods that are accurate, but solving a linear programming problem can be slow. And then we have interval methods that are much faster, but they can be too conservative. And modern methods like Deep Poly and Crown can tighten those intervals to give you the best of both worlds. All right, that's where I'm gonna leave this video. If you enjoyed this explanation, you can find all of the Tech Talk videos across many different topics nicely organized at mathworks.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.